Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. An elevated green with no backdrop to it creates a depth perception problem. And that's one of the things that we always try to play on, subtle things that make the golf course a little more difficult or can challenge the player without making it really more physically difficult. And the more you can challenge a player's ability to feel a shot, the better you can make the golf course interesting to play, but yet not a lot more physically difficult. And elevated beams with no backdrop is one thing. You know, how you position bunkers on a fairway to create depth perception. For instance, if you put a bunker on the short side of a hole and it's a big, long bunker, and you put one just 10 or 15 yards longer on the left side and you make it a smaller bunker, you've created a depth perception issue where that bunk on the left looks like it's miles further out there. And it makes it a little harder to feel the shot. So those are kind of mad scientist type things that we work on. <laughs> With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to Golf Smarter for members only trip. Well, I'm glad to be here. And I, you know, in between these two recordings, you mentioned that you're leaving for China in matter of moments, so you don't have a ton of time, and I really appreciate you saying yes to be doing this, so let's just get right to it. Um, and when you're, you're talking about golf course design and what kind of impact it has on the average golfer, now, before I leave this last topic, when you were designing um, it, the tribute, down in the colony, Texas, and you were recreating your favorite Scotland holes. Uh, I've got to imagine that uh, I've never played in Scotland, but I th would think that a lot of the golf courses there um, are pretty much dictated by the, not just the terrain, but the weather. Absolutely. I mean, the, the wind is, is one of the more prevalent factors. And, you know, and obviously over there, um, it's not... Uh, uh, 107 degrees in July. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the big difference between um, Scotland and Dallas can be the extreme heat. But from a playing standpoint, the uh, the, the more critical element is, is wind. And, uh, you know, there's a lesser element into the fact that when, you know, it's, it's uh, hot out in the U.S., the ball can sometimes travel further and so forth. But um, it's it's not that big of a factor compared to the wind. So, uh, but, you know, the biggest things that we tried to recreate there from the playing conditions perspective is making sure that the golf course plays firm and fast um, because, you know, that's such a big part of the way that the strategy of those courses work in Scotland is how the ball can bounce, how you can use the ground to run shots from the greens, and, uh, you know, some of my favorite holes from over there are the ones where you don't fly the ball to the hole. Uh, you've got to land it short. You've got to creatively use the slopes that were uh, built in to get to certain pin locations. And so that, that was a central part of the design uh, at, at the Tribute. So you're telling me when I... I um... It doesn't play like a parkland course that's that's prevalent throughout the United States. So when I get a chance to go out and play the tribute, I should be thinking of laying up a lot instead of trying to hit the greens. Is this what you're telling me? Well, you don't necessarily have to lay up, but when you're hitting a shot into the green, you don't necessarily have to fly it to the green. Um, oh, okay. The the benefit um, uh, is in using the slopes. You know, the sixth hole at the at the tribute, for instance, is is my recreation or my interpretation tribute to uh, one of the holes at, at Macrahanish on the uh, up in the northwest part of Scotland. And the slopes around the green allow you to bump a ball in and use the slopes to feed it back into the green. And whereas if you try to fly it to the green, um, and you run the risk of it running through the green. Um, uh, and it's a little more difficult to get to some of the pin locations by flying it because if you, uh, even if the greens are a little softer um, at, at any given time, you've got to fly that ball a certain distance. If you run it into the green, uh, your margin for error is a little less because the slopes will help contain the ball. Um, and so that's what I mean by 
kind of bumping and running shots in or using the ground and, and, instead of flying it to the hole. So that's the kind of stuff that absolutely fascinates me about golf course architecture and design is um, using the elements that you have as strategic uh, approaches for a golf shot, um, like elevated greens. And what you're saying is, mm-hmm. right, it, 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 right. you don't necessarily want to try to land it onto the green. You want to get it up to it. But if you come too slow, you come up too low, it's going to fall back. Well, that's the that's the fun thing about golf course design is there are really limitless ways in which you can use the ground, you can use the elements, you can use the conditions the golf course is going to be maintained in. Um, you know, the the uh, to try to design, for instance, the same golf course uh, on bent grass versus Bermuda and so forth. You, if you're trying to create the same playability, there's got to be changes in the way that the golf course is built so that those features. Uh, work the same way. Uh, you know, bent grass is a totally different playing surface, both in the way you play a shot off of it um, as compared to Bermuda grass. And, you know, that's changed a little bit over the years, uh, and uh, you know, in large measure because we're mowing fairly so much tighter than we used to. But um, uh, there are just limitless ways in which you can conceive um, how a player is going to play the hole and, and, and how multiple players can play the hole. I'm a big proponent um, of giving as many players as many options to play the hole, not only just because it will fit their uh, playing style, but because it allows every player uh, of equal scoring ability uh, the ability to compete with each other. One of the things that I am dismayed about with the game today is how long we're making golf courses, not only on tour, uh, but for the average player. Uh, it, it really has become a game more about power um, in certain respects. And when the game is, is about scoring, it's not about how you hit the ball, it's about how quickly you get the ball in the hole. And so design needs to give players of different abilities and different approaches to the game uh, options on how they can play the game, play each hole, and, and score the thing. Actually, you you beat me to it. I was going to ask the question about uh, how does equipment, today's equipment, and how radically it's changed over the last uh, five to eight years, um, how does that dictate course design? Well, it you know it, it's it's um, there can be a good argument made for um, uh, how it has dictated course design and versus whether or not course design could uh, uh, create some sort of balance between uh, the equipment today that we can play with and, and the players that play today. I mean, you know, the, um, you know the, the guys that are playing today, you know, Tiger Woods and Dustin Johnson, these guys are athletes. Um, you know, they're and not to say that Nicholas and, and Tom Watson and, you know, the, the greats of the past weren't athletic. Um, but these guys can swing the club, you know, so much faster, and uh, they can hit the ball so much higher, and so forth. And and golf course design, the response to it was let's challenge those players with greater physical ability, whether it's the physical nature of, that they bring to the game themselves, or what the equipment helps them do physically. And so we've we've looked at challenging players physically uh, more so than strategically and mentally in a lot, a lot of ways. Um, you know, and, it, and in a lot of ways, Fred, it doesn't make sense because um, if you want to challenge the longer player, um, making the golf course longer is not necessarily challenging them. It's playing into their hands. Um, what, what's, what you find um, challenges the, the longer player better is not always being able to use their length and then also having to compete against a broader range of players. If you take a 144-player field on the PGA Tour and you've got 15 power players and the golf course is 7,700 yards long, uh, you don't have many of those players in that 144-player field that can really compete physically. And so, uh, the uh, but whereas when you get a golf course that's you know around 7,000 yards, um, and, you know also depending on how firm and fast it plays how many shots the player is required to play, um, you bring a lot of players back into the game. I think the setup that Troon had, uh, excuse me, Turnberry had, the year that Watson almost won, 
is a perfect example of how uh, the golf course was there to challenge a player's ability to score and not what they could do physically. Yeah, I, I've played courses that are not necessarily long, but it's very obvious that if you don't have a good short game, it's going to eat you alive. Right. I mean, it's going to put you in a, in a position where this is, you know, you, you, you get onto the green and you go, oh, my gosh, this is definitely a three-putt green and possibly four. Exactly, and you know, and and even at that, the you know, the, the ultimate golf course is going to be one that uh, doesn't overly penalize someone with a you know an average short game. Um, it's it's one where uh, the player is kind of called on to be able to execute a broad range of shots, so that no one strength they have will dominate the golf course, uh, but no one weakness that they have can't be overcome in some way if they know how to use their strengths in a way to overcome certain weaknesses. And um, uh, that's what we're looking at when we're looking at de- when we're designing golf courses is, is we don't try to focus on, on making the, the golf course about any one strength. We're trying to balance the golf course out so that the guy that can hit it a long way has got the advantage on certain holes. But on other holes, he's got to be more accurate. He's got to be a little more precise. He may have to use a short game. Uh, he may have to uh, uh, do other things within the game uh, to be able to excel in the golf course uh, as a whole. And um, that's, that's really where golf design needs to fall in terms of being able to make the game enjoyable for uh, all player levels and, and then also when it comes to championship golf, being able to identify the player who can shoot the best four. How much pressure is there from developers, the people with the money who are coming to hire you saying, I need a golf course, I want a golf course here, I want it to be on the tour? You know, do you, well, is, you, there, is there a lot of that saying, this course, is, you've got to design this, we've got to get this one on the tour because it's going to get, help me get my money back type of thing? Well, there's, there's two, two kind of pressures that, you know, you run into that. I mean, the course we're doing in China right now is one that they hope to be able to host uh, championships. And um, uh, when we did Old American, there was some pressure there that we want to eventually host something like the U.S. Public Amateur or the U.S. Amateur uh, you know, uh, you know, was, Old American was actually recently, um, they, they listed four courses that should host tour events around the country. Awesome. Uh, and it was one of those that was included in that list. And, Congratulations. And, yeah, that was pretty kind of cool. Yeah. But the, um, the other pressure is to make it something a standard. You know, in China, for instance, uh, if the golf course isn't par 72, if it's par 71 or par 70, uh, the culture over there sees it as a lesser golf course. Uh-huh. And, you know, in the United States, it's been, you know, the golf course has got to be 7,000 yards long to be seen as a championship golf course. Um, and the perception is that if it can host a tour event or if we can host a tour event, uh, you know, if it's long enough, if it's of a standard quality, that it uh, will help to attract um, players and, and help the golf course be sustainable. Um, so you, you you have to balance that to some extent. Um, you know, in the in, in China, for instance, there's a bit of kind of a funny story about that. And that the the land we had to work with, the way that everything worked out, um, my original design was a par 71, and um, um, uh, that's just the way the holes fit on the land the best. And they and the owner was adamant that we had a par 72. And so what we ended up doing was making that hole an optional par four, par three, kind of like George Thomas had done uh, a number of golf courses that he did back in the 20s, uh, the guy that was on Riviera and L.A. Country Club in Bel Air. And um, so we were able to keep it a par three for, from the back tee, but for the number, um, it, it's a short par four. And so... Um, that's how we, you know, sometimes balance that pressure. Hmm. How often do you have to design a course, or not even how often, what kind of demands are there, is that you design a course or you design a hole for playability versus maintenance? 
Well, it's uh, um, you know, playability is 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 um, not necessarily um, always pitted against maintenance. You know, challenge sometimes can be pitted against maintenance. Uh, you know, and it depends on how you define playability. But um, the we're, we we always have to be aware that our client is that X amount of dollars to be able to sustain the golf course from a maintenance perspective. Um, and so, um, you know, some of our clients, um, you know, they'll have an unlimited maintenance budget. Uh, some of them are in markets where they're not exactly sure where that may fall. And we have to be cognizant of that so that when we design the golf course, the, the, the maintainability can be flexible in some ways. Uh, if we've got a project where uh, it's in a new market and, you know, 10 years from now, their maintenance budget may be cut by 20%, we've got to be aware that, uh, we don't want the golf course at that time to then have to be redesigned or not maintained to a decent standard because we can't maintain it all. Um, but the big thing that we have the ability to work with, uh, if you're creative enough, is to design a golf course that the setup can dictate how playable it is, how challenging it is, versus uh, how maintainable it is. It's, it's completely possible to build a golf course that is highly maintainable, but if you grow the rough a little bit, um, you, you get the fairways a little firmer, you get the greens a little faster. Uh, if you've imparted enough subtlety into the golf course to make those really increase the challenge level, um, then, then uh, you can build a golf course that's adaptable. Uh, and it can go the other way, too. For instance, if, uh, uh, to make it a little more playable for the average player, if you cut the rough, you widen the fairways a little bit, um, slow the greens down, soften them up a little bit, it becomes more playable. What are your favorite, well, we'll call them features, your favorite design features? I mean, uh, as a golfer, I call them distractions, but, you know, um, whether they be uh, fairway bunkers, greenside bunkers, water, um, elevated greens, what are the features that you, you know, I guess that is your signature? Oh, you know, Fred, I don't know if we have a signature in that way. Um, um, you know, it all depends on the land in, in a lot of respects. And um, and we do start every project by trying to work towards some sort of uh, uh, concept, whether you call it a theme. And, you know, and, and when I say theme, it doesn't necessarily mean a visual theme or a uh, there's a story behind it as much as we are. Um, looking at the way the features will be built. Um, you know, we're doing a project. We've got a number of projects right now where we've got, you know, five different bunker styles. I mean, from um, doing a uh, restoration at Brook Hollow in Dallas where we're doing a, a tilling hatch style bunker that's got a little more, it's got more capes and bays in it, um, to um, a pretty maxwell restoration up in northeast Oklahoma where he had originally done grass-based bunkers with very little shape to them and, and sand in the bottom, uh, to Old American, which is more lynx-like in terms of, you know, when I say lynx, I mean more like Irish lynx-like, where your bunkers are a little ragged-edged and so forth. So you, you, you want to be able to adapt to the site, and the ability to have more of a broad creative range on how you use those features is important. Now, how you use those features... Um, uh, can uh, get you into what I think your question was mostly about and as to how do I use the features in such a way that it enhances the play of the game. And, you know, for instance, an elevated green with no backdrop to it um, creates a depth perception problem. Um, and that's one of the things that we always try to play on is subtle things that make the golf course a little more difficult or can challenge the player uh, without making it really more physically difficult. And the more you can challenge a player's ability to feel a shot, uh, the better you can make the golf course interesting to play, uh, but yet not a lot more physically difficult. And, you know, elevated beams with no backdrop is one thing. You know, how you position bunkers in a fairway uh, to create depth perception. Uh, for instance, if you put a bunker on the short side of a hole and it's a big, long bunker, and you put one just, you know, 10 or 15 yards longer, on the left side, and you make it a smaller bunker, you've created a depth perception issue where that, that bunker on the left looks like it's miles further out there. And it makes it a little harder to feel the shot. So those are the kind of 
the uh, mad scientist type things that we work on. <laughs> that you probably laugh behind your back. What do you mean feel? You mean for the golfer when they're standing there addressing, looking at their shot, deciding what they have to do? Is that what you mean by feel a shot? Right. And, you know, the, the, um, just think of it this way. I mean, when you, when you hit an eight iron, if you stand on a range and you're trying to hit your eight iron 140 yards, um, if you're on the range and you've got a perfectly level eye, there's no wind, you can, uh, with a lot of practice and skill, can retrieve that shot to where you can hit it 135 to 145 yards. But you get out on the golf course and you end up with an uphill lie or a downhill lie, a side hill lie. The green's 30 feet below you uh, or 30 feet above you. The wind at your back or it's in, in your face. Um, you can't just judge strictly on distance. You have yeah. to kind of feel that shot. Yeah, how long it and, took me to figure that out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so the the cues that we can throw out there as golf course architects um, can either sometimes in, in, encourage your ability to feel a shot or we can uh, make it more of a challenge to be able to feel a shot. Um, and it doesn't go to just distances as well. It can go to uh, whether or not you want to favor the right shot you know, if a player can move the ball right, right to left, it may, you know, we may build a hole that looks like a right to left shot. It's going to feel more, it's going to feel more comfortable to them. Whereas we can create a hole that looks more like a left to right shot. And, you know, for a player that plays the ball right to left, that hole feels less comfortable. You mentioned earlier about um, if, a, if a course is a par 70 or 71, you said what in China that they think it's a lesser of a golf course. I, yeah, I can see that. I, I mean, I can see it's like, oh, it's only par seventy-one, but it just means there's one less par five. There's only one less par three, basically. Um, do, it it you, depends. You know, we um, we've done a lot of par seventy-ones recently, and, hmm. and um, you know, in large measure, it's because of the way the land works or, and so forth. And I'm also a big fan of. Uh, um, having more than four par threes on uh, on a golf course, so you know a fifth par three can add a lot of variety to a golf course. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, in the last episode about the rhythm of a golf course and the way that the golf course flows. And uh, you know, I'm a big proponent in making every hole feel a little different. And it's harder to make two par fours feel different than it is if you have a par three following a par four. Yeah, uh, just simply because of the length of the hole and the way that you're going to play the shot. And so um, we often will will do that. We'll you know we want to we'll make a par seventy one not necessarily by one less par five but one more par three. Um, and uh, um, so you know it really comes down to the quality of the golf course. I mean one of my favorite golf courses in the world is one of Morsick, uh in in Providence, Rhode Island. It's an old Donald Ross course that, that they play the Northeast Amateur on, and it's a par sixty nine. Wow. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a great golf course. Wow. Um, I played, uh, of course, Seviano Lynx up in Corning, California. I just posted a video on YouTube about it. Um, and it's a John Daly design, so it's very long. But there's mm-hmm. three par threes and three par fives on each side. Mm-hmm. And I found that to be really entertaining. Yeah, you know, as long as those holes fit the land, um, and and they create more interest in the way that the the, the, the course is played, um, then that's great. I, I don't think there should be any standards um, as to having, you know, third part thirty six on both sides, um, uh, and or you know that you have to have um, four par fives and four par threes, and they don't need to be in any uh, sort of order. Uh, you know, Capoeira, where they play the first term of the year, par 73. And, and that's because when uh, Bill, Bill uh, Cord and Crenshaw were building it, uh, they had an extra par 5 that fit into the landscape better. So. Yeah, I, I find it far more. I found it far more entertaining to have that kind of variety. You know, it's like when you come par four, par four, par four. It's like just hit it, just hit it far, and then you know, set yourself up. And I don't necessarily um, like pulling out the driver every time. I like teeing off with a three wood occasionally and setting myself up for, you know, a shot that I'm going to strategically be more comfortable with hitting it 125 yards, you know, uh, versus 160 yards or 
I, I like that kind of variety. Yeah, it's it's you know the variety is uh, is the most important part about keeping the golf course interesting. Yeah, and um, so it's it's vital. And what brings uh, the average golfer back again and again? Is it interesting or is it scoring? Is like okay, I can beat this course. I'm coming back, or this is such a challenge, like golf is in itself. This is such a challenge. I got to come back and try to, you know, beat this beast. I think you know, for the average player, it's it's uh, um, you know, it's it can be a lot of different things. You know, it can be scoring. It can be the visual nature of the golf course. Uh, it can be the interesting shots that they have to play. Um, and so, um, you know, it can be a wide, wide variety of things. I mean, it's one of the great things about the game is that uh, every player is going to bring their own perspective to the golf course and what, uh, what uh, gets their juices flowing. Um, and it's, you know, typically for the average player, when we're designing a golf course, um, and, you know, to make sure that the average player can have fun, uh, and, you know, 20 years of doing this, the feedback that I get is less about scoring and it's less about visual as much as it is about uh, um, constant variety within the golf course. That they're never having to play the same shot, that they're always having to do something different. Um, and uh, that's, that's, you know, the most important thing. And um, at the same time, you don't want to beat the average player up. I mean, you don't want that, uh, uh, you don't want a 10 handicap going out there and, and not being able to break 90. Um, yeah, well, but, they walk away from the course going, I hate this place. Yeah, they can. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, you know, interest is more important than anything. And that was reinforced last weekend. We opened uh, a course called Turtle Dunes in Acapulco. And, uh, uh, I was uh, very interested to see what the players had to say afterwards. We had, we had about 100 players play that day. And um, uh, so I stepped around and talked to a lot of them. And um, uh, while a lot of them would say, you know, I've, I've shot lower than my handicap, you know, I really enjoyed things. The main thing that was always given back was that every hole had a different feel, and I was always interested in what I was doing. That's and, fabulous. Uh, that's important. Yeah, because so often when you see websites, you read reviews of golf courses, they talk about the beauty around it. And it's like, really? Is it, That's the best you've got is that it's so, such a beautiful place. Which, listen, I, I love playing on places that are visually spectacular around the course or the wildlife that's flying or running by. But still... I think you're right. The variety of shots that you have to take makes, you know, if, the more clubs you can use in your bag, the more entertaining your day is going to be. It, it, yeah, it's, you know, it's um, uh, playing on a, on a site right by the ocean or, you know, there's, uh, there's obvious interest in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, one of my favorite golf courses in the world, too, is, is Garden City up on Long Island. And, you know, it's in the middle of town. There's, you know, there's nothing around it to really see. The, the big, one of the last golf, is golf courses you'd call beautiful from an athletic perspective. Um, but it's, it's beautiful from the standpoint that uh, you're constantly being confronted with having to play different shots. And uh, those are the golf courses that fit, tend to stand the test of time better. Hmm. Do you have time for one more question, or do I have to invite you to come back again? I got time for one more. Does that mean you're not going to come back? Well, I'll come back too, but I got time for one more. <laughs> okay. The difference, and hopefully this is an easy answer. What's the difference between restoration, renovation, and reconstruction on a golf course when you get involved in a project? Well, uh, renovation is is really trying to put the golf course back into the state it was um, uh, before it deteriorated in some way. Uh, renovation, you know, can also it can uh, most times mean just maintenance-related things. Uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, the features of a golf course really have lifespan. They don't you know, last forever. You know, a bunker is not going to function the way you want it to forever. Uh, tees don't stay level. Uh, forever, uh, greens don't grow grass and, and aren't as maintainable uh, as you want them to be forever as well. So, renovation oftentimes just means you know restoring or putting those things back into a way that they can function properly. 
uh, restoration is more about uh, putting it back into a state that it was in that was uh, some form of higher design, some form of higher functionality, some form of higher uh, historic quality. Um, so we're, we're, we're not only um, uh, making the, the feature itself more functional, we're also introducing the way that it was intended to be played, uh, in some cases the way it was intended to look. Uh, and too often times what we get caught up in with restoration is um, putting it back the way that it was instead of understanding why the way it was. Um, for instance, if you can put a green back to the way it was in the 1920s, that possibly not, might not be playable at today's green speed. But if you understand why the green was designed the way it was, why there was a back shelf on a par 5 that required you to land the shot short and bump it up to that back pin location, you can restore it in such a way that modern player can experience the golf course the way it was intended to be. And that's really what restoration should be about. Uh, reconstruction is, uh, can take on a lot of different forms, right? I mean, it can be um, everything from completely rebuilding a golf course in a different routing. Um, it can be um, taking a feature on a golf course that historically or today doesn't function properly or didn't function properly and re reconstructing it in such a way that it has more interest and plays better. Um, you know, in the modern times, a lot of times reconstruction will go to rebranding the golf course in such a way that uh, they can open themselves up to a broader market appeal. Absolutely fascinating trip. I again, I really appreciate you giving me this much time, and I wish you uh, great success, continued success, um, and that you become a legend, so we can talk about you for years to come and your courses. And please, safe travels uh, and good luck in the Far East. Well, thanks. Uh, anytime.